let's get started. Uh, let's talk about chess. Okay, so I'll just say right off the bat, I was never really a, a big chess player. Um, I had played a little bit, but I think speed chess gave me sort of like a renewed fun of the game. And so I wanted to sort of talk to you about what it's like and uh, what you should know about it and why it's very, very, very different from sort of classic chess. So maybe we can start by talking about classic chess. So here's generally what it looks like. This is sort of currently the world champ. He's playing a multi hour long game that is uh, full of strategy and deep and very heady. And so I'm gonna go over maybe some of the things about classic chess and, and, and maybe a mixed bag of stuff that's kind of true and stuff that maybe isn't all good characters. So um, I think when you think about chess, first of all, it's like, hey, it's kind of this slow, uh, grandpa game and it's just not as sort of maybe invigorating or exciting. And I think that's largely true, but maybe recently it's, it's, it's been maybe less true. Um, if you watch the Queen's Gambit, it's actually a pretty fun, uh, show on Netflix. Um, definitely a good drama around sort of like chess world. Um, and Twitch has actually in the last couple of years really emerged as a, as a new force for chess. We'll cover that in a, in a, in a little bit. Most people, when they think about chess, they think about maybe a chess club in high school, a bunch of dorks and dweebs, people that they maybe are less socially adept that they want to hang out with. And I think that's mostly right, except when you get to the grandmaster level, these people are wild just in terms of their intellect and kind of how badass and maybe eclectic they are. Uh, Bobby Fischer like learned Russian just to read more Russian stuff about chess. He had sort of this Babe Ruth pointing moment and in one turn like world champion moment where he said, I'm just going to beat this guy in 25 moves and did it in 24. So they all have sort of these weird things about them. Uh, Gary Kasparov, a very famous anti-Putin um, political activist. He's doing a lot around Ukraine right now. Um, when computers were getting good, they were like, go get Gary. He's kind of the best guy to deal with this. And now we have sort of like a kind of like a uh, heartthrob looking grandmaster. This is probably the best who's ever lived. Um, but I'm going to show you a slide in a moment of where it sort of chess is transformed. Um, th th these people have wild lives. And, and I think that at, sort of at the top end, it, it's, it's maybe a little bit more exciting than people maybe lead on. Uh, one more thing about classical chess, people generally say it sort of takes forever and, it, and it's, it, it's slow to learn. And I think that's largely true. And I think one thing about speed chess that was cool for me is that this is where I usually like to play chess. So young kids, I've got these windows of time where I'm either like on the toilet or like walking around with the baby. And I've got like maybe five or 10 minutes to blow off a game of chess. And so speed chess online really enables me to do that. Uh, also with work, I generally will try to do like a 75 minute uh, dedicated session. And then I take a 10 or 15 minute break. It's a great time to get one or two games of speed chess and where I otherwise I couldn't play that in a classical chess game. The last thing to note, uh, maybe it's not exciting enough in terms of an action sport. It's kind of like baseball. It's just very slow. People don't get it. This is much more my speed in terms of what I like to do and fill my time with. And so speed chess really captivated me because there is this uh, sort of like bravado about speed chess because it's fun and it's exciting, it's entertaining and it's quick. Um, and so this is maybe another fun iteration of chess, but this is also in person and getting other people sort of in the same room to play with you is sometimes it's hard. All right, let's talk about this thing in the red box. This is actually a clock. Most people don't know that chess is timed because it's never really a factor. You don't generally hear about it. Or if you play like somebody on the street, you know, you just sort of sit down and play and, until you get bored. But the clock is actually a very real part of professional chess. And so with speed chess, uh, you really sort of take the clock and you turn it way, 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 way down such that time really becomes a factor in terms of what you're doing and it adds to the gameplay dynamic. So to give you a, a sample of things, classical chess, you get 90 minutes for your first 40 moves and then you get 30 minutes for the rest of the game. But each move you make, you're getting 30 seconds back. When you go over to speed chess, you might play something called a five plus three. I'm actually going to play Zach one of these in a minute um, where you actually get five total minutes, not like 120 minutes, but five. And you get three seconds for each move back and it'll go all the way down to something called a one plus zero, which means you've got one minute and there's no seconds in, in, in terms of additional time that you get back for each move. So this is, it just changes the game dramatically because you have to run off of pattern recognition and intuition as opposed to analysis and really slow thinking. So, all right. Um, the last thing to note is that I think when computers and, and online chess became a thing is really when this started to get fun. Because if you see in this green box right here, there's 40,000 players online. I'm going to be able to get matched with somebody from around the world that's right at my skill level. That's going to be a good game. I'm not going to get totally waxed and I'm not going to totally kill them. Um, it, it, it just turns out to be a much more fun experience because you can play these rapid games over and over again with people that are right at your skill level. So you're sort of learning. It's a challenge, but you're learning along the way. Um, 
Okay, so as we look into sort of like rapid chess and especially online, like I said, quick games, you get this instant reset, you don't got to fix the board, you're paired with somebody that's exactly your skill level, so you don't have to meet these people online, you can just jump onto your phone, play a game for 10 minutes, you get matched up immediately. They've got really good analysis and training tools. So post game, you can kind of go back and figure out what did I do wrong? Was there anything bad here? Um, what can I learn for next time that you can get dropped into specific puzzles, et cetera. Um, and it's sort of turned into this facts to action sport. Funny, um, funny enough, I, uh, Major League Baseball is actually making rules changes to timing because of how slow the sport is and how much they're maybe losing uh, people in terms of entertainment value. You watch something like the NFL. It's very quick. There's a lot of movement on the screen with baseball. It's just kind of pitch after pitch after pitch. It's sort of not. So anyway, chess in this regard, I think becomes a, a fast action sport and it becomes entertaining. So let's take a look at some of the entertainers. Um, this is a, a woman named Alex Botez. She's sort of playing one of these New York chess hustlers. She's actually a levels member. Funny enough, I got to talk to her a couple months ago. Um, was hilarious that she kind of came across my inbox because I had seen her a couple times on YouTube. Um, look at this dude, like a bleach tip kind of hoodie. He's got his own swag behind him. These people have personality followings because they've got these personas and they're just on Twitch a lot of the time. Um, this is Magnus Carlsen, the sort of current reigning world champion, like drunk with his entourage in a hotel room, like flipping off whoever he was just playing. I, I don't I don't know what it is about speed chess, but it is truly like a different ethos compared to sort of like the classical competitive chess that you might play your grandfather or your uncle because he has some wooden chess set he got from Italy. So anyway, this is why I love it. It's got that redneck feel, that Ricky Bobby feel to it. And uh, it's really fun. So I'm going to talk about some basics about chess, chess and then we're going to play a, game, play a game and I'm going to sort of try to annotate it as time goes on. Okay. So couple, one thing to know about chess is it's a game of perfect information. There's no such thing as bluffing. Everybody, Everybody has all the information. They know all the possible moves. It's really just, are you better than the other person? That's kind of it. That's really just honestly it. Right now, computers are beating humans and there's probably no chance for humans to ever come back. They just don't have the ability to sort of change their strategy. The computers are just better. Um, Playing online is obviously better than in person for all the reasons that I said, uh, especially around like the study and the study. practice. Um, and the last thing is it feels good to win. So um, game of perfect information. This is Gary Kasparov. He's paying, he's playing 30 people at one time, 30 people at one time. And he will probably go on to beat all of them because there's no game style thing that he has to worry about. He can just sort of play the board and he doesn't have to play the opponent. He's really good at what he does. Um, here are some learning modules. So a lot of the websites that you might go to, um, they can drill specific things into you, specific situations, and you just start to build your pattern recognition and understand the mechanics and how things move and, and sort of why it's fun. So easy to get started online without getting a thick chess book about the power of the pawn or something like that. Um, the last thing is, do you see this graph at the bottom? So this is a game that I just played. And um, computers are, have this cool engine ability where at any point in the game, it'll sort of give you a, a number or a score about how like sort of powerful your future prospects look. And so um, we're going to go over points in a, in a second or a point framework. But um, the one thing that I just wanted to point out is that after every game now online, it's very easy to use a computer chess engine to show you these big swings and valleys in your gameplay. And generally what that means is you really made a bad move or your opponent really made a bad move because the sort of future outlook in terms of your score goes through these massive swings up and down. And so after I play these games, I sort of go back and I'll look for these peaks and valleys because sometimes I'll lose and it's not clear why, like where the turning point was. I didn't completely just throw a piece away, for example. And so this is a really good chance to sort of go back to that point in time and say, okay, well, what if I would have played it different? And this is all enabled just through online stuff. All right, let's talk about piece basics. Okay, so there's a couple piece types. Um, first one is a pawn. Um, these things generally just move in one direction forward. So look at the red square, and then these green circles are sort of the uh, the, the squares that it is able to move to legally. Um, so pawns just sort of move in a forward fashion. They can only attack diagonally and forward, though. So just keep that in mind. Um, the one exception is for pawns when they're on the starting line, they can move their first move. They can move two if they want to. So these are pawns. Knights are going. Um, sort of in a tricky pattern. Uh, so you see all these green squares. They can never go completely up, down, side to side, or diagonal. They're always going two squares in one direction and one in the other. These are exceedingly tricky to deal with. And especially as a beginner, they are sometimes difficult to handle. It gets better as time goes on, though. All right, bishops, these ones move sideways. Um, and keep in mind the points, too. I'll, I'll, I'll explain those in a minute. So bishops are going to go sideways, or, or sorry, I'm sorry, diagonally. Um, 
in, in this sort of fashion. You've got rooks or castles, if you want to call it that. These are up, down, and left, right. Very powerful pieces. We would consider this a five-point piece. And then your queens, which get to go kind of do whatever they want. So except in they, they, they can't move like a, a knight does, but they can move in one continuous motion basically in any direction. So this is what makes knights tricky is even queens can't move like they can. So, all right. Points framework, why do we have points? Well, we're using like this one, three, five, nine framework. It's really easy for us to make decisions about what to do. So if you're in this situation, let's say I'm white and it's white to move, I can sort of move my bishop on top of the queen to take it, which means I sort of gain nine points, but the rook would come in and then down and take my bishop away. So I would lose three points. But if you do the math, that's a really good trade. So this is just like a good heuristic when you're a beginner to keep in mind for like what pieces are good to exchange. Um, Cause sometimes it's not always obvious. Similar thing here, I could take the rook. So I, and then the queen would take me. So I'm gonna lose three, but I would gain five plus two. I would call that a win. So I would, I would, I would almost always make that trade. Here's an example of a bad one. If I use my rook to take their bishop, I would I would gain three, but then they would sort of take me back. I would lose five. That's a negative two. I would say that's probably not a fair trade to make. Okay, we did points. Um, let's talk about some forced movements. Okay, so one rule just to keep in mind is around checks. So this is when one of your pieces um, moves into a position that then threatens the king. In this situation, you have to either move the king out of the way or you have to put another piece in front of that piece just to make sure that there's no direct line to your king uh, anymore. So this is one situation you can put your opponent in where they have to move on purpose. And so in this case, uh, you move the king away, life's good. All right, next up, we have something called a pin. Um, so it looks like black has moved their knight into a position where on the next move, it could take my rook. I do not want this to happen. One situation in which I can avoid this is just to move the rook out of the way. That's that's also worthwhile. The other situation is to actually take this bishop and move it in a way such that if the knight would move, that I would get access to a higher value piece. And so that's this is called a pin, which we would say, hey, the knight's currently pinned to this square. Because if it were to take the rook, then the bishop could take the queen. And I would take that exchange every time. So I lose the lose the uh, sorry, lose the rook minus five. I would win a queen that's plus nine. That's definitely a good position. So we would call this knight pinned. All right. One other thing, and, and sorry, just to be clear, like these are just good as a beginner, just to have some sort of like language around these concepts so that we can have a common verbiage to talk about what's going on. So when I I'm gonna play Zach in a minute, and I'm, you're gonna hear me use some of these words as I'm thinking out loud about what we're doing. The next thing is called a skewer. Um, and so a skewer happens when you move one of your pieces such that you're threatening a piece and then behind the piece, it sort of opens up an attack. And so uh, in this situation, if I move my rook over, I'm immediately attacking this queen. It can't come down and take because the king would defend it. And so you've got a couple options. Um, so this is this is the current setup. Uh, ideally here, you just move the queen out of the way because you don't wanna lose your queen. And then the rook could come and take the bishop. Um, and win a piece, that's great. Because um, the other option is not great, you would, lose your, you would lose your queen. And so this is called a skewer, is when you kind of get pieces lined up and you're sort of attacking one, and by virtue of it moving out of the way, you sort of open up attack on another. Um, let's look at another skewer. Okay, this is called, maybe called like a hard skewer where you've got, uh, you've got something behind a king. So if I can move my bishop over here, you'll notice that it me immediately puts them into check and there's a queen kind of waiting behind the king. So if I'm in check, this king's got to move out of the way. And then it opens up access for me to attack the queen on the next move. Um, here's the other direction where you've got, you cannot move this queen out of the way because it would open you up to check. So that's also an illegal thing. Um, and so if I do move this, I basically am going to win this piece because there's no way for the queen to move out of the way without without putting itself into check that would be an illegal move so in this situation you're forced to just sort of kill the piece backwards so the queen would come and take the bishop but then i would sort of collect the queen with the rook so in a lot of these situations you're moving into this position with some guarding um so usually a king is nearby or you have another piece that's providing some coverage so that you can do the attack and then if they come to sort of take your piece you've got another one there to collect it so skewers are, pr are particularly hard to deal with uh, all right, let's talk about two more things and then we're going to play. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late, but that's okay. All right, let's talk about forks. Okay, so a fork is when you are attacking two pieces at once. And because you can only move one piece out of the way at a time, you're sort of guaranteed to get one of the two. So in this case, if I move my bishop, uh, or sorry, if I move my knight into this square, on my next turn, I can either 
take the queen or I can take the rook. And so they've got to decide, well, okay, I got to move one of these pieces out of the way. Um, ideally, the higher value one that I don't want to get taken. So if I move here, ideally, they'll just get the queen out of the way and then I can collect the rook. Fantastic. Okay. So forks can happen uh, not just with knights. Knights are the trickiest ones to do. Generally, when you get caught in, the, in a later stage of the game in a bad place, it's generally due to a knight. Um, but they can happen with pawns as well. So if I push this pawn forward, it's now attacking both of these pieces. They cannot get both of them out of the way on one turn. And so you would probably just move the rook out of the way and I would win maybe the knight here. Same thing with a bishop. This is a very common thing um, to fork a king and a rook. And so I would move to kill this pawn right here. It puts the king in check. You have to move the king out of the way. And then I would take the, uh, the, the, the rook on the next play. Okay. Uh, one more, let me check the, actually the chat really. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Zach and Brett. You guys are doing the Lord's work. Thank you. Okay. All right. Discovery. This is maybe the most insidious of all. And this is where, um, especially in speed chess, you can sort of get in over your, over, over, over your ski tips because you don't notice certain things. Okay. So right now it would look like if I'm playing white, that, that, that this queen is maybe attacking this. I've got a rook here. One of the things that you have to be careful of is when you move pieces and it brings other pieces into play. And so specifically for this one, what I'm looking at is if I move this knight out of the way, this rook is now checking the king. So the piece that I moved is not necessarily checking the king, but by virtue of moving it, it's opened up a new line that they now have to respond to. Now, this situation is particularly bad because... It, it, it issues a check. There's no way for the sort of, um, there's no way for them to sort of deal with this. So the king has to move out of the way. And if you'll notice, by virtue of me moving my knight, I can now attack the queen on the next move. So this is called a discovery attack. Um, these are really, really, really hard to deal with. Um, and it's something you, you just sort of get better at as time goes on. So anyway, those are some chess basics. I thought I would just give you maybe a sample of sort of the things and some language that we can use to um do it and so i'm going to actually play now and what i'm going to do is there's some cool tools to sort of annotate uh the board and so we're going to try we're going to try to do this um so let me give zach this link sweet all right okay so generally chess is divided up into um three stages there's called the opening the mid game and the end game and they all have kind of different things to deal with what i'm doing right now is just trying to get my pieces out from behind so if you'll notice when my knight's back here it can only kind of defend these squares but nothing's really sitting in there and so by getting my knight out i open up a bunch of other things that i'm now sort of territorially taking advantage of right um, and so generally when I say, when I'm, when I'm opening with stuff, I'll say when in doubt develop, that's generally like, Hey, if there's no clear attack, we just want to start to get our pieces out from sort of behind the pawns so that we can open up attacks. Right. So this Bishop now has a bunch of purview, um, on things. It's now protecting this square, et cetera. And so Zach's kind of doing the same thing. Like this pawn didn't necessarily attack anything. What it is though, is it's guarding this square now. Cause if I wanted to move my knight here, this pawn's there. And so in the opening game, you see a lot of this. There's not a lot of action. You're just sort of getting your pieces up and, and situated. And so um, I need to figure out maybe one thing I noticed right here is that this, this bishop in particular is maybe blocked right now. Um, and so uh, maybe a common thing to do would be to sort of push up here in a way. Now I'm expecting him to come take this and then I can sort of move it, move my knight over. This is maybe centralizing my pieces over on the right side of the screen. But it does free up this bishop now to do some things that are interesting, like come into throw check to attack the king. Okay, what do we do from here? So a lot of chess, I think, is counting as well. And so we've got a lot of tension up here in the front. And I'm thinking, okay, I could take his piece. He'll take back. I'll take back. He'll take back. And we just sort of do some counting that way. Um, this one is maybe less defended. Hmm. Yeah, see, even doing this in real time is hard. Oh, I forgot. See, I didn't even, I, I totally forgot that the queen was there. So even doing this, like I've been playing for thousands of games and I'm still sometimes I will miss, um, I will miss specific things. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that right there because if I take his piece, he's got a lot to cover. 
This one seems unguarded though. So I'm curious about what I can do here. I'm keeping track of him attacking because that would be my only way to take the piece back. And then you sort of double up your pawn structure and it can get a little bit weird. So let's, let's do that. Um, if you hit him right. with a check on that bishop, then he can't castle. Oh, but uh, now you're four. Here. He could... So I think Brett's suggesting... Oh, no. Is this what you're suggesting here? No, get, get your queen out of the way first. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so that that uh, that knight was definitely attacking the queen. So I want to make sure I clear out the space in front of me. Um, okay, keep an eye on my time. I've already burned through two minutes of my time. Okay, he did. He just did a special move called castling, um, which is where you sort of swap your king and your rook, but you can only really do so if you haven't moved either of them. There's a, there's some there's some details there to work out, but so he's got some good protection here. I mean his his. His um his king is sitting behind a couple of pawns. He's got, I mean, he's got a, he's got a lot of comfort here. And so I'm starting to look at, okay, well, how do I how do I start to position my pieces where I can launch an attack? Because eventually I'm gonna have to probably head that direction. Um so one thing to do. Hmm. I'm a little concerned about this thing hanging out because the only defender it has right now is this one, but I'm not sure there's much I can do about that. So when in doubt develops, I'm just going to pull another piece up. It's it, it this now opens up this whole angle right here. Um, he's going to have to start to keep an eye on this square because this bishop's coming all the way down in terms of its attack potential. It's also guarded by this pawn. And so if something were to come attack it, I've got at least a defender there. What things can I call out? Um, hmm. Okay. He has, this would be an interesting fork potential because I've got another thing covering the square, but he's got one, two things as well. So that's sort of like an even exchange. You could probably. Promote that pawn uh, to make the uh, three cover and they can't use that queen on you. You're talking about this one? Yeah. 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 So this pawn can now attack there. Oh, but it lost its defender. So he, so this, so this is now open. Oh, he's such a nice. Okay. So let me, I'll back up one move. This is an interesting example of maybe like a discovery situation where by virtue of me taking that, I'm now opening up a different set of things to happen. So he's got to be careful. Let me, let me go let me forward. Go okay. Um, okay. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking here, here, and then that opens up this. Hmm. I'm also, I'm also worried about worried my king still being in the center, center on our board. So man, what to do? One thing to note about Zach is that he's rated 1500 and I'm rated about 1100, which means he's going to beat me every single time, pretty much without exception. So definitely just not keep, every single time. Just keep that in mind. Um, okay. I'm going to get my King to safety. Um, I'm already up a pawn. Remember we talked about the point structure, so I'm happy to give one away. Okay. So here's a, here's an interesting discovery. So he, by virtue of taking this, this line now opens. So I needed to be aware of that. And just clear that out. Okay, so now I'm I'm really worried about this happening right now. Um, this side of the board has really, really opened, opened up. up. Okay, so, so Zach, if you could give me a little bit more time, just hit the plus button. It'll give you a I, couple seconds. Uh, the plus button next to my name. Oh, it, it's okay. I can just hurry. All right, so I'm 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 moving this knight into position. My hope is that here we get into a fork situation. So I've got. Two things that I'm now attacking. There's no way that he's going to be able to defend both of them. Thank you. Yeah, we're good. We can just play it out from here on out because we're out of time. 
Um, so these are sort of the sorts of things that I'm looking for. So for here, um, so that's so that interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna go here because it'll throw a check, but what it'll also do is move that piece out of the way so that I'm now attacking this one piece. And it's currently unguarded. So this is a discovery, right? So we talked about discovery. So he didn't have something guarding this. So this was just, like, just a like a one one piece right there. Um, all, right, all right, we've still got this to attack there. Ooh, interesting. Uh, okay. I'm worried about. I'm going to go hide the king. I'm really worried about this. I still have one to defend it. He's got this, though, which is really scary to me right now. And his king's pretty safe. I don't really know. So the, the benefit of playing online is that, you know, you can sort of talk through these games in a way. What was that move? Free pawn next to your queen. Yeah, I know, but I'm I'm really suspicious of of the play. So this is, um, this is a good example of, I'm going to go back and after the game, I'll like hit this in the analysis mode and figure out like, was that deliberate and there's something that I didn't see or was that a mistake in a way? Because this pawn's unguarded right now. Um, Uh, okay, let's just take it. I'm really, wor I'm really, really worried about what's about to happen right now. <laughs> just get the sense. It's not going to end well. Uh, Zach, are you letting me win? Like, what's the... I'm not letting you win. I, I, I am being a little experimental, but I'm definitely not letting you win. Okay. Uh... Okay, so I'm thinking knight here, knight here to attack this. Because if my queen can come over too, that would be checkmate. But I still got to deal with this guy. Okay. Uh, all right, so here's where time gets in. Is is I just got a ding dong in my ears. And now I've got 30 seconds left basically for the entirety of the game. Okay, so this is, this is where it's scary is because he's got two things coming down. And I've got one here and one here. So... Mm, what to do okay so this is where this is where time so i just i don't really have a good move right now that i know of and i just sort of threw that move to get him back, back on, the, on time the time and for me to sort of have to get a, a better look at what i should do next because i honestly have no idea um we're at this stage in the game right now where i think it makes sense to, to start, start pushing, pushing there's a lot of pawns that are kind of hanging out by the kings or like on the starting line basically and oh, i'm gonna, I'm have, gonna to have to that to... was that was accidental. That was that was fat thumbs. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll I'll do this, um, and you can. Just, oh, I, I didn't. Oh, okay. I didn't see it. Uh, oh, I okay. I didn't even see that open up. Um, so as we get into the late game, you have to start to push, push your stuff. Your stuff. In, in, in the early and the game. middle games, you're in this position where. Um, um, in the early and the mid game, you're in this position where you kind of want to have some safety so that you can develop your pieces and get to a good spot. Uh, okay, check. Here. Okay, so I'm thinking here and then here. Uh, that didn't do me any. Oh, no. Okay. Sometimes it's good to just push your. Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, so ran out of time. I'm looking at eight seconds left and you just start to lose track of what's going what's on because I'm trying to sort of instrument an attack in a way. And there was this sort of threat the whole time where Zach just needed to sort of maneuver his his queen in and he had some protection. So this is checkmate. So anyway, um, that's, that's one game of speed chess. So you could see now I'm going to go into going. sort of the analysis board. You can request a computer analysis. It's going to go through and basically the, the computer engine will identify kind of the entirety of what's going on. We're gonna play one more game just so we can sort of hammer home like the speed chess thing. Um, let me let me actually get that started right yeah, now. And, and I'll, I'll add one thing that, you know, this is a five, three that we just played. And so one thing that you probably noticed is early on, 
um, I made a point to move super quickly. So I actually ended up having more than five minutes for a period of the game. And so a, a lot of the strategy is if, if you have a good structure early, then you can be in a position where the other person has a lot of time pressure and you actually have a lot of sort of mental like room to, to, to breathe. Um, so the one zero that we'll play now will go by very fast and there is virtually no room to breathe. So yeah. it's very yeah. different. Um, okay, so here's so here's the board. This was, Zach did make a, a weird move that I didn't notice and he moved it back. That's totally <laughs> fine. But you can see these, these swings where uh, the engine sort of, Zach did make this move. So I talked about this discovery that I did here where I moved this out of the way and the engine actually picked this up. So you see this big swing down when he made this move because the engine knew, hey, you can, you can move this out of the way to throw a check. It's a forced move. You've got a discovery attack and there's nothing guarding this bishop. So you can go back and review these things. It's just a really good way to do it. All right, let's play the one. Let's play the one. Uh, okay, all right, this is going to go... Can I, can I talk to people while you guys play so yeah. you can play better? Sure. I, All right. I so don't know that... uh, I'm going to annotate real quick. Oh. Oops. Uh, uh, so it, it, when you see this, this center ring here, yeah. Uh, but like think of, of the board as rings like this. So you, from an ownership perspective, you're looking to own <laughs> more of the center ring. Uh, so I'm going Oh no. <laughs> okay, so there's no there's there's no time to think. Like you just have to kind of act. Uh shoot. Uh, uh what to do, what to do, what to do. So I'm already I'm already in bad shape. Uh <laughs> I never play one zeros, so I'm like, yeah, like, 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 look at the time disparity. Okay, so I'm gonna try to. Oh shoot, I, I totally missed that. Um, all right, I have no idea how this is gonna work. Okay, uh, this is probably a bad strategy. Uh, so notice that like my my pawns are getting kind of ushered up through my. Uh, uh, oh no! Oh no! Oh no. Oh, okay. Ran out of time. All right. Like I had two seconds there where I basically stopped to think and like all my time went away. Notice I burned up an entire minute and Zach, I think on paternity leave has been playing nothing but one zero. He's got three, seven <laughs> seconds left. It's, it's almost hard to even see the board. And so some of the, when you actually, a lot of the grandmasters that play on Twitch will just play one zero exclusively. And it is phenomenal how well they just sort of fluidly move through the board and life's just good for them. And I think that they've just played maybe a hundred thousand games in their life. And the neural engine of their brain is just working in such a way that is quite remarkable. And so when you watch it, you're like, oh, that looks fun. And it looks doable. And of course, like all those moves make sense. It seems like they're making it. But when you're trying to keep track of it yourself on the board, it's just rough. So anyway, okay. I know we're over time. So I'll stop the share there. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs> that was really fun to watch. Thanks, guys. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to. If you want to get good, play Zach. If you uh, if you want to <laughs> if you want to, if you want to have a good uh, you need opponent, you can play me. Um, funny enough, actually, Brett and I played when Brett interviewed for levels. We did play chess as part of the interview, which was kind of fun. And so, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Did you let him win? Yeah. Uh, I know. I think he beat me. I think he beat me pretty legitimately. That's, yeah. I think all that's right. what happens. Yeah. The recruiting tactic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone. Okay, guys. Thanks, Scott.